Hello my bookish friends. In this video we're going to be taking a look at Great Expectations by Charles Dickens and we're going deep. Now if you haven't read the book that doesn't matter because there will be no spoilers in this. There will be quite a lot read from the book and if you have read the book that, and you want to understand it much more deeply, if you're really trying to get into literature and go beyond just the story, you are going to love this review. So without further ado, let us sally forth. Great Expectations is probably Charles Dickens' most famous work. And many have studied it at classroom, high school level, college level. And often, if you've been taught it that way, you've no doubt heard the expression that the book is about what it takes to be a gentleman. What is a real gentleman? I'm going to disagree with that wholeheartedly. And by the end of this video, you'll know why. And I hope I'll have convinced you why. It does involve characteristics of being a gentleman. In fact, there's one particular sentence which probably lends itself to that idea. However, this is what Great Expectations is really about. Are you ready? It's about Great Expectations. That is, the great expectations we all have. This is universal and timeless. We all have great ambitions, ideas, hopes and desires for our future, for ourselves, for our family. And all of our expectations take a toll on us as a character, for good or for bad. And that's what this book is about. And it is written in such a way as to open you wide up. Your reaction to the characters in this book define a lot about who you are right now. Okay, so... The way to lay the basis for this book is on the opening page. We meet the protagonist, Philip Pirrip. He's a little boy and he can't say his name, so he calls himself Pip. His mother and father are dead and he's raised by his sister, Mrs. Joe Gargery, and her simple but lovable husband, the blacksmith, Joe Gargery. And Joe Gargery and Pip are like bosom buddies. Joe is always saying, ever the best of friends, ain't we, Pip? Ever the best of friends. And Pip doesn't have any ambitions, he just takes for granted that he will grow up and become the blacksmith's apprentice um, and then a blacksmith himself when he's old enough. But we get an insight into the whole theme of the book and I would say this is perhaps the most important part of a paragraph in the whole book and it's on the very first page. As I never saw my father or my mother and never saw any likeness of either of them for their days were long before the days of photographs my first fancies regarding what they were like were unreasonably derived from their tombstones. The shape of the letters on my father's gave me an odd idea that he was a square, stout, dark man with curly black hair. From the character and turn of the inscription, also Georgiana, wife of the above, I drew a childish conclusion that my mother was freckled and sickly. Do you understand that? Based upon the inscription written on the tombstone, here lies Mr. Pirrip, died such and such a year. The way that's written, Pip draws a conclusion about what his father must have looked like and been like. Now, it's, it makes us smile. It's such a childish way of looking at the world. But here's the point. When it comes to our expectations in life, what we think makes a great life, a life worth living, something that will satisfy us, Often we're no different to Pip, a little boy guessing what someone looks like just by the inscriptions. We look at all the vanities and fripperies of the world and we draw conclusions about what that would make us in our life. And that's the beginning of Great Expectations. What are our expectations actually founded on? And are they real and worthwhile? One thing you spot very early on is the constant references to mist. There's always a lot of mist on the marshes. Everywhere he goes, when he meets the, um, the prisoner on the marsh, when he's in the graveyard, when he travels into town, when he goes to the, the prison hulks, everything's in mist. Everything's shrouded. It's like he's hemmed into this little microcosm. But that mist demonstrates a life without any great purpose a life sort of cocooned, not knowing really where one's going. Pip 
just takes for granted that he's going to be a blacksmith, and he knows little outside of his own little village. And this mist gives us that effect. Everything seems to surprise Pip. It comes out of the mist towards him. However, when Pip starts to get some ideas of where he's going to go, you'll notice that the mists begin to clear. It's almost as if a, an horizon appears before him. Things begin to change for Pip when he meets the girl Estella and the famous Miss Havisham constantly in her wedding dress at Satis House. Estella is a beautiful girl. She's been raised properly, as it were, um, in the sense of manners and refinement. And she's in this grand house. And suddenly Pip becomes aware, almost for the first time, that he's inadequate. Estella ridicules him. She knows that he, he likes her, that he fancies her. But she says about, oh, how ugly and coarse your hands are. And Pip's never noticed his hands before. And suddenly he starts feeling shame at who he is. He's no longer content. And this is the beginning of a change in mind where Pip begins to introduce into his life desires and goals and ambitions and wants, which have an effect on his young personality. He wants to marry Estella. He loves her. He wants to have her approval. But he knows he needs to be educated and refined and he doesn't dwell in a lofty house, but he dwells in a little blacksmith's hut. And so from here we start to see the change in Pip, and will it affect him for the good or the bad? Now the story really begins to get going when a man comes along at the behest of an unknown benefactor who has left a huge amount of money to Pip so that he may become a man of great expectations. Yes, a gentleman. And we don't know who this benefactor is, and Pip's not just given all the money, it's actually allocated to someone who will be his guardian and mentor and give him a monthly stipend to look after him. But as soon as this happens, Pip now begins to dream of what kind of life he wants to have. The idea of Estella, and now he's being able to get on parity with her, and maybe win her, that becomes part of his ideas. He starts thinking of living in London and becoming an important person or a great person. And this has a notable effect on the young Pip, who is quite adorable up to this point. Just listen to what's said um, about Pip's attitude towards Joe Gargery, his blacksmith uncle, who is more of a playmate to him and who constantly says, we're ever the best of friends, ain't we, Pip? Listen to how he starts thinking of him towards the time he's going to leave to go to London to fulfil his great expectations. Oh dear good Joe, whom I was so ready to leave and so unthankful to, I see you again, with your muscular blacksmith's arm before your eyes, and your broad chest heaving, and your voice dying away. Oh dear good, faithful, tender Joe, I feel the loving tremble of your hand upon my arm as solemnly this day as if it had been the rustle of an angel's wing. But I encouraged Joe at the time. I was lost in the mazes of my future fortunes and could not retrace the bypaths we had trodden together. Exquisite writing. Pip's here reflecting on how good Joe was. You know, his touch on, on young Pip's shoulder as he was going to leave was like the rustle of an angel's wing. Isn't that beautiful? But it says he was lost in the mazes of his great fortunes that he was going to go for. Joe was now something lower than him. He had got bigger things ahead. And in fact, what's interesting, just before he leaves, Pip speaks to um, a friend of his who taught him, Biddy, and says, Biddy educate Joe and make him a little more refined because, you know, when I'm a gentleman, it's, it's not going to look so good if he comes and visits me with all these coarse behaviours. And this is a point where a lot of readers begin to start not liking Pip. However, I'm going to put something to you if you've read it or are about to read it. Be careful how you judge Pip because Pip is doing what all of us do. He's got ideas and it's changing his manners. To dislike Pip by the end of this book says an awful lot about 
yourself. And it's a tacit admission that you're not quite the kind of person you would like to be if you think Pip is really dislikable. Bear that in mind when you read it. And if you do dislike Pip, put in the comments a counter-argument to that. Further expounding on this change of personality, a sort of growing hauteur, a sort of pride, and um, looking down upon his humble origins. Just before, I think it's the eve before he leaves to go to London. Look at what Pip says about the stars. He says, At those times I would get up and look out at the door. For our kitchen door opened at once upon the night and stood open on summer evenings to air the room. The very stars to which I then raised my eyes, I am afraid I took to be but poor and humble stars for glittering on the rustic objects among which I had passed my life. Ooh, that's um, a very honest admission by Pip. We have this beautiful scene, really, where the, the camera is right in on Pip. And there he is staring up and the camera just zooms right back to the stars and then comes back in to Pip. This comparison of the heavenly celestial lights to Pip. And yet Pip thinks these celestial lights are very humble and rude because they shine upon this rustic blacksmith's house. Whether as a youngster he thinks the stars are going to be different over London, I don't know. But nonetheless, what a condescending attitude he started to develop. And why? All because of his expectations. What he hopes to become. Maybe more importantly, what he thinks he should become. And this is where the book, this is where classic literature talks to us. It goes beyond a story. It's challenging us. Are my expectations based upon something that brings happiness or something that I think they should be? Because it will change our personality. Focusing on this idea of expectations and how they relate to our life, we're going to just take a look now at Miss Havisham, the woman at Satis House who is a lady but is forever in her wedding dress, a very unusual and enchanting figure. Miss Havisham almost sums up in this story the consequences of holding on to broken great expectations. An expectation that one was maybe within touch of and just cannot give it up. And what that does to somebody. Because Miss Havisham is this decrepit and bitter woman who, although she's raised Estella as a, a fine, pretty young girl, very well trained in mannerliness and etiquette, Estella is a very twisted character because Love is not in the picture. Bitterness has been the lesson infused in her and a hatred of men by Miss Havisham. Let's just take a look at a scene in which Miss Havisham is described and start to get a sense of what Charles Dickens is saying about what expectations do to us. It was not in the first few moments that I saw all these things, though I saw more of them in the first moments than might be supposed. But I saw that everything within my view which ought to be white had been white long ago and had lost its luster and was faded and yellow. I saw that the bride within the bridal dress had withered like the dress and like the flowers and had no brightness left but the brightness of her sunken eyes. I saw that the dress had been put upon a rounded figure of a young woman and that the figure upon which it now hung loose had shrunk to skin and bone. Do you get the sense of how Miss Havisham is locked in time? She cannot move on. Her whole being is faded yellow. It's linked only to an expectation in the past, where she was jilted on her wedding day. And you see her still always wearing her wedding dress. She's surrounded by ornaments and jewellery which she never ever puts on. She only wears one of the shoes because she had only put one shoe on when the news came to her that the guy she was about to marry has gone off. And she's only ever kept that one shoe on. 
the clocks are all stopped at the time she heard that she had been jilted. She is frozen in time. And we get a bit of a sense that this is what a powerful expectation can do if we can't let go. In fact, another little scene really pushes this home to what expectations can do to the soul when they're not managed correctly. Let's just look at that. I crossed the staircase landing and entered the room she indicated. From that room, too, the daylight was completely excluded, and it had an airless smell that was oppressive. A fire had lately kindled in the damp old-fashioned grate, and it was more disposed to go out than to burn up, and the reluctant smoke which hung in the room seemed colder than the clearer air, like our own marsh mist. Certain wintry branches of candles on the high chimney-piece faintly lighted the chamber, or, it would be more expressive to say, faintly troubled its darkness. It was spacious, and I dare say had once been handsome, but every discernible thing in it was covered with dust and mould and dropping to pieces. The most prominent object was a long table with a tablecloth spread on it, as if a feast had been in preparation when the house and the clocks all stopped together and a pern or centrepiece of some kind was in the middle of this cloth. It was so heavily overhung with cobwebs that its form was quite undistinguishable, and, as I looked along the yellow expanse out of which I remember it seeming to grow like a black fungus, I saw speckled-legged spiders with blotchy bodies running home to it and running out from it, as if some circumstance of the greatest public importance had just transpired in the spider community. Now, what a brilliant way to conjure a bygone age in which Miss Havisham has ground to a halt and never, ever moved on. The stopped clocks, the cobwebs hanging on everything. Not only has, has Miss Havisham grown old, but everything has gone yellow in her soul. All of her desires, her personality, her spirit, her soul, has gone yellow and cobweb-strewn. And did you notice the reference to the fire smoke being like the mist of the marches? Remember, the mist clouds any horizon. It's a life with no purpose. The purpose is hemmed in. It even said light, even a bright, a hope, can't break through the darkness. Rather, light troubles the darkness. So not letting go of great expectations can be just as damaging as setting expectations which are unrealistic or what you think they should be rather than what they should be. Do you begin to get a grasp of what this book is doing to us, the challenge it is putting to us? Now, when we dig deep like this, this is why classical literature matters to you, to me. And then Charles Dickens almost summing up what he's getting at with Miss Havisham, what thought he's provoking, is just in this very short and exquisitely written paragraph. She held the head of her stick against her heart as she stood looking at the table. She in her once white dress, all yellow and withered, the once white cloth, all yellow and withered, everything around in a state to crumble under a touch. How magnificent is that? Do you see how elegantly Dickens has summed up the idea of not being able to let go of an expectation which is unrealistic and how it troubles the whole life? Perhaps someone hoped to be famous, but it never got there. However, they've never discharged it from their brain. They always desire it, and now they're later on in life, but they're ready to crumble to the touch. They've become a husk of life. They have never been able to become steadfast in some other happy situation that they could have made. Rather, they're yellowing, withered, and about to disappear into dust. Coming back to Pip himself, he arrives in London and Dickens seems to give us a sort of a wide-angle shot of what great expectations are really made of, where they really come from, and the reality of what they often are. On the day that Pip goes to meet 
his guardian in London, Pip has come to a realisation or a private thought that London is a rather dirty and dank and dark place, not at all what he imagined it to be. Yet, look at what he says in this paragraph and see whether or not anything has changed today. We Britons had at that time particularly settled that it was treasonable to doubt our having and our being the best of everything. Otherwise, while I was scared by the immensity of London, I think I might have had some faint doubts whether it was not rather ugly, crooked, narrow and dirty. The simplicity of a child here, a young man. From his own vision, what he sees, he's privately thinking that London is ugly, crooked, narrow and dark and dirty. But why doesn't he accept that? Because it says, well, society's opinion is that we have the best of everything. And so if I've come to London with a bit of money behind me, I can accomplish great expectations and this is real living. Now, how much does that sound like today? It's all glitz and glam on the TV. If I said to you, does money make you happy, you will probably all to a person say, no, of course not. And yet what do we strive for most of our lives? Money. Why? Because I want this car. I want this job. I, I want to spend all my time in a gym so I can look amazing because that will change my life somehow. I want to go under surgery because if I look amazing, my life will be happier. These are all the fringe elements of life. And while we each, like Pip, recognise that they're crooked, narrow ways, we can't help but still go after them because society says that's the route to happiness. We have great expectations, but are they beneficial? Are they beneficial to Pip, even? Well, you'll see that when you read the book, or if you have, you know how he goes through a sort of a, a rotation of personality, trying to get what he thinks would make him happy, and what actually does. Now we're going to move on to another character in our digging through Great Expectations to find its root theme and idea, and that is the fabulous, I mean, I'm mesmerised by this character, Jaggers. Jaggers doesn't appear an awful lot in the book, but he's this ever-present spirit, this haunting background that pervades the whole time Pip is within London. Jaggers is a lawyer and he seems to stand aloof from everything. I don't mean proud, just he's separated. He's always digging other people out of their problems, sort of getting people out of debtor's prison, for instance. He's forever telling people, don't confide things in me or I will have to act. People live in awe of him. He has this commanding presence around him that is somewhat intimidating. What's noticeable to me in the way Dickens describes Jaggers is not in who he is as a person, but in what his study looks like. Let's read that to see what Dickens is trying to get across. Mr Jaggers own high-backed chair was of deadly black horsehair with rows of brass nails round it, like a coffin. And I fancied I could see how he leaned back in it and bit his forefinger at the clients. The room was but small, and the clients seemed to have had a habit of backing up against the wall, the wall especially opposite to Mr Jagger's chair being greasy with shoulders. I sat down in the clientele chair placed over against Mr Jagger's chair and became fascinated by the dismal atmosphere of the place. I called to mind that the clerk had the same air of knowing something to everybody else's disadvantage as his master had. What kind of atmosphere do you pick up from that writing? Dark black, no, deadly black horsehair chair, studded with brass nails like a coffin. The clerk knows something to the disadvantage of everyone, as if Jaggers and his team can see through your soul. And the people who have been past Jaggers in his life with all their aims and ambitions and all the follies that they've committed, did you notice how they were like ghosts? Because 
they had backed up against the wall so many times that they had rubbed the imprint of their shoulders on the wall so that they were like silhouettes left in Jagger's study. You get the idea that Jagger's symbolises, or at least feels like, death, or maybe fate. One of the governing high gods, as it were, who can see and search through a human's course, and before whom all life is just a blip. And this is why Jagger's is so astounding, although he doesn't do much or, or talk much in the whole book. Just when he is around, he commands. He's always telling Pip not to aim at high things, but to be sensible, especially with his money and who he mixes with. Everyone's scared of Jaggers. Jaggers says that he his house is full of silver, but there are no locks on the door. He says it's there for thieves to steal, but nobody breaks in and steals because everyone is scared of the repercussions from Jaggers. No one really wants to tempt fate. And that is a masterful character to sort of counterbalance Pip and his great expectations. He counterbalances Miss Havisham as well because Jaggers is linked to Miss Havisham through the story, but again, read it to find out how. But if you've read it already, go back and have a quick look at Jaggers and what Dickens seems to be saying about great expectations. Jaggers is not interested in them. All great expectations are fleeting before Jaggers. Our lives are nothing more than the greasy-shouldered silhouette against the wall facing our final judgment. What a magnificent way to render life through story. There's a little scene shortly after seeing Jaggers study which brings home to Pip, although he won't acknowledge it to start with, the reality of life. He's waiting at the office, and one of the clerks says, go and take a turn in the air. If you go around the corner, you'll go into Smithfield. And so Pip takes him up on the, the recommendation, and he goes to Smithfield. What he now sees is not an accident of writing. Dickens is deliberately making a comment about grandiose ideas and expectations in our own life, which are not true, which are castles in the clouds, as it were. Watch what happens when he goes to Smithfield. When I told the clerk that I would take a turn in the air while I waited, he advised me to go round the corner and I should come into Smithfield. So I came into Smithfield. And the shameful place, being all a smear with filth and fat and blood and foam, seemed to stick to me. So I rubbed it off with all possible speed by turning into a street where I saw the great black dome of St. Paul's bulging at me from behind a grim stone building, which a bystander said was Newgate Prison. Following the wall of the jail, I found the roadway covered with straw to deaden the noise of passing vehicles. And from this, and from the quantity of people standing about, smelling strongly of spirits and beer, I inferred that the trials were on. Did you notice? Real life. Did you notice it was from Jagger's office that he was sent to Smithfield? They knew what Smithfield was like. They could see this young man with high pretensions, thinking that because he's got money given to him, he's going to be someone great. They send him to Smithfield, which is the shambles. It's, it's the area of the butchers. So there's offal and fat and blood and foam in the streets. That's not what Pip imagined when he went to London. Life is not all roses. And happiness does not come from dwelling in some kind of utopia of the mind. In fact, a bit later regarding the prison, a magistrate says, Whoa, four of them are going to be hanged today. So this place is full of death. And of course, there was that simple lick of a line where Pip says, I rubbed it off at all possible speed because he said this bad stuff stuck to me. No, 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 it's not going to be like that for me. I know it's going to be great. Society says we have the best of everything. Yes, that's what Dickens is saying. That's what Jaggers particularly is saying. Life is not to be something pretended to. Don't aim for things that are frivolous, which are at the very edges of existence, which 
and the grand scheme of things count as a husk that is about to fall apart at the touch. Get a sense of what is right and real, Pip, and you, the reader. This is why I say don't judge Pip, because can you see that we, the reader, are Pip? There is a final sentence. It's not the final sentence of the book, in fact. Where is it? It comes that far through the book. This sentence is the one which I think many latch onto when they say great expectations is about what it means to be a gentleman. And in this sentence and aspect, they're correct, but it's within the context of expectations. Remember, it's not about what it is to be a gentleman. It's, it is, I have the expectations of being a great gentleman and life will be wonderful and I will rise above the, the lower masses and their poor and lowly ways like Joe Gargery. Listen to what's said by one of Pip's mentors. But that he was not to be without ignorance or prejudice mistaken for a gentleman, my father most strongly asseverates, because it is a principle of his that no man who was not a true gentleman at heart ever was, since the world began, a true gentleman in manner. He says, no varnish can hide the grain of the wood, and that the more varnish you put on, the more the grain will express itself. You just want to fall down and worship prose like that, don't you? You can see how this sentence has lent itself to the idea of great expectations being about a gentleman, but it is merely a spoke in the wheel of the grander idea of what our expectations in life do to us. Our expectations can make us act like a gentleman. They can place varnish on us, like, like the manners of Estella. She's quite a bitter and, and twisted little girl in some respects, not due to her own doing, but how she's been raised. But she is perfectly varnished. But the varnish actually brings out the traits of a person even more. It brings out the grain of the wood. And you'll see some of the people that Pip mixes with are rich young gentlemen. But it's interesting to see what they're like. You'll also see another gentleman called Compison and compare him to another man called Magwitch. Now, they're two opposite ends of the spectrum. But which one is the finer? Who is the real gentleman there? And it's not just about the form of being a gentleman. It is that the manner of a person at heart is truly what guides a good life. And so being a gentleman is part of it, but it is our expectations that shape who we are inside. We saw little Pip, a very funny little commentator, and his love for his Joe Gargery, and then this expectation causing him to put on airs and graces and to begin looking down on what he once was and aiming at something higher. But does it make him happier? And where does he end up? When you read Great Expectations, I hope that this in-depth look at the book and it's what I consider the main idea, I hope it has an effect for you. I hope it makes your reading experience a thousand times more enjoyable. And at the end of it, ask yourself, how much do I dislike Pip? Or how much do I sympathise with him? And then the classics are speaking to you. You may have noticed that my channel is going to deal with book reviews of the classics, but not just on the surface. The, this channel is for those of you who want to dig deep and really get into a conversation that pulls out the universal themes that are written in the classic books. The classics should challenge us and chastise us. So if you enjoy classics and classic literature, and of course that includes Shakespeare, which I cover a lot, and you want to have in-depth reviews of these things, please hit the subscribe button and let's start a big conversation around the classics. Oh, and ring the bell, apparently, that's important. All the best with your reading.